Before I tell you the country and the year that today's case took place, I first want to introduce you to the sponsor of today's video, Mistplay. By now, many of you have probably figured out that I like playing games. And if you do too, Mistplay is perfect for you. Misplay is a loyalty app for gamers where you can earn rewards simply by discovering and playing mobile games. Playing can help you cover your Amazon purchases, daily coffee, Spotify subscriptions or some other expense. Misplay offers a huge catalogue of games so you'll definitely find some great ones. Also, the more you play, the more points you earn. So far, over a hundred million dollars in gift cards have already been redeemed. Thanks to Misplay, I found Three Tiles, a tile matching game that trains your brain, which helps me relax from the stress that can come with investigating crime cases. Visit misplay.com forward slash briefcase or click the link in the description to download Misplay for free. You'll get 200 bonus points for signing up today. Plus use my code briefcase50 inside the app for an additional 50 free points which will help towards redeeming your first gift card. Now let's go to mid 19th century England. Sarah Reynolds was born in the year 1819 in the small town of Potton in the English county of Bedfordshire. She was the daughter of Mr. Philip Reynolds who worked as a tailor and his wife Anne. Sarah's childhood was filled with simple pleasures of rural life until tragedy struck when she was just seven years old, as her father died. In the wake of his passing, her mother sought companionship and stability by entertaining a succession of suitors, each bringing their own presence and influence into their lives. During these years, life for ordinary people in England was marked by both progress and hardship. The Industrial Revolution continued to drive urbanization, with many leaving rural areas to seek employment in growing industrial towns. However, the working conditions in factories and mills are often gruelling, with long hours, low wages and unsafe working conditions. Families would crowd into cramped and unsanitary housing, which sometimes led to widespread poverty and disease among the working class. Despite these challenges, there are notable advancements in education and healthcare. The establishment of schools and educational initiatives aimed to provide basic literacy and numeracy skills to children from poor backgrounds. Additionally, generous benefactors often gave money to fund hospitals and clinics, improving the access to health care for many. The rise of the middle class brought about changes in social norms and values, with the emphasis on respectability and morality. In 1837, Queen Victoria ascended to the throne, following the death of her uncle King William IV. Her reign would continue to shape the lives of ordinary people in Britain as the country tried to manage the complexities and opportunities presented by the evolving global landscape. Despite the challenges Sarah encountered, she grew into a charming and graceful young woman. One young man even commented that her warm brown eyes reflected her kindness and her long auburn hair danced in the breeze. At 19 years old, Sarah married Mr. Simeon Mead a respectable man who lived in a neighbouring village. At first, they settled in Potton. However, murmurs of marital discord swirled through the town, with speculation rife about the cause of their troubles. Some whispered that Sarah's alleged indiscreet behaviour had cast a shadow over their marriage, while others attributed their woes to more mundane reasons. Despite these rumours, the couple presented a united front to the residents of Potton, maintaining a facade of normality in their daily lives. Yet the gossip persisted, creating an undercurrent of tension that tainted the tranquility of their existence. Eventually, they made the decision to leave the town and move a short distance to the village of Tadlow. It was here that in February 1840, where Sarah gave birth to a baby boy who the couple named Jonah. However, their dreams of a new beginning were shattered by tragedy. Sarah's heartache was immeasurable when her son Jonah passed away at the tender age of seven months. The loss was a heavy burden for the couple to bear. Sarah's sorrow deepened further when a short time later, her husband Simeon unexpectedly died, leaving Sarah alone to face the complexities of life as a young widow. Though grief weighed heavily upon her, she faced the future with quiet resolve, determined to carry on despite the trials that life had dealt her. 
At first, she assumed the role of both grieving mother and grieving widow. However, her period in mourning was short-lived as she swiftly entered into a new relationship with a 23-year-old young man named Mr. William Daisley. This relationship soon stirred up a whirlwind of negative gossip and raised significant suspicion among the villagers. In February of 1841, just four months after the death of her husband, Sarah married for the second time and became Miss Sarah Daisley. Not wanting to stay amongst all the wagging tongues, they moved to Wrestlingworth, a quaint village situated a few miles from Potton. Sarah, seemingly eager to rebuild her life, extended an invitation to Miss Anne Mead, her deceased husband's teenage niece, to join them in their new home. Anne, who had faced hardship following her uncle's death and lacking family support, accepted Sarah's offer. She had been living in very difficult circumstances and was grateful for the chance of stability. Anne now found comfort in the companionship of her aunt. However, there were soon signs of discord in Sarah's marriage as her husband, Mr. William Daisley, started to drink in the village pub. This led to inevitable clashes with his wife and tensions reached a boiling point in October after Sarah's visit to the Potton Fair, where it was said that she conducted herself in a quite disreputable manner. When she returned home, the couple had a loud and heated altercation. Many words were exchanged, most of which were heard by the neighbors and resulted in William striking his wife. Sarah's history of entanglements with other men and her husband's jealousy now seemed to be the talk of the village. Wherever Sarah went, she would see people whispering to each other and then look at her as she passed. She confided in her close friend, Mr. William Waldock, and told him about her marital problems. She said that she would not take any sort of physical aggression from her husband and told him that she would kill any man who dared to lay a hand on her. Sarah took to telling anyone who would listen of her husband's alcohol-induced acts of violence, but many believed that she embellished these tales to try to divert attention away from her own indiscretions. However, the story she spun provided a detailed depiction of the turbulent relationship that she had with her husband and only prompted more gossip within the community about the issues behind their marital troubles. In October 1842, William Daisley started to feel ill. He suffered relentless bouts of vomiting and stomach pains. As his condition got worse, Sarah seemed to become more concerned for her husband's well-being. She sought the help of the local physician, a gentleman named Dr. Sandal, and he prescribed a simple remedy, reassuring both William and Sarah that his ailment was nothing to be concerned about. But Sarah was worried. She told her friend and neighbor, a lady named Mrs. Carver, that William was not getting any better and that she would get another prescription from Dr. Sandal. However, Mrs. Carver was taken aback when she witnessed Sarah discarding the pills that the doctor had given her and instead put different ones in the pillbox. Mrs. Carver questioned Sarah about why she had thrown out the pills that the doctor had given her. And although she considered Mrs. Sarah Daisley a friend, she could not help feeling a mixture of confusion and suspicion and thought that something was very much amiss but Sarah calmly explained that she felt that Dr. Sandal's medication was not helping her husband, so had decided to seek a remedy from the village healer. When Mrs. Carver went home, she remained uncertain as to the true nature of Sarah's actions and intentions. Unbeknown to Mrs. Carver was as a few hours earlier, as William remained bedridden, Anne Mead had gone to the kitchen to fetch some water, where she saw Sarah quietly preparing pills. Her actions, seemingly routine, yet oddly secretive. Anne observed her doing this for some moments, but did not grasp the full significance of what she had witnessed. When Sarah returned home, she gave the pills to William, who immediately noticed that they were different and refused to take them. Sarah tried to tell him that they would make him better, but he would not listen. It was Anne who eventually persuaded him that they were fine. She did so by grabbing one of the pills and swallowed it herself. William, his mind no longer clouded with uncertainty, took one as well. Somewhat inevitably, both William and Anne soon became ill, with the familiar symptoms of sickness and stomach pains. William now doubled up in pain, vomited in the neighbor's yard, where the pig stayed, one of which later consumed his vomit. The next morning, the pig was dead. Despite William and Anne becoming ill, 
Somehow Sarah managed to convince her husband that the pills were going to make him better and he continued to take them. However, as days went by, William's health continued to deteriorate, much to the dismay of those around him. Tragically, on the 30th of October, his condition took a turn for the worse and he died. After a brief examination, the attending doctor concluded that William's death was from natural causes, attributing it to the progression of his illness. Yet beneath the surface of this seemingly straightforward determination, whispers of doubt lingered among the townspeople, hinting at the possibility of a more sinister truth lurking beneath the facade of normality. He was laid to rest in the local churchyard, a sombre procession of mourners bidding farewell to a life that had ended too soon. The solemn toll of the church bell echoed through wrestling worth as villagers gathered to pay their respects. However, against the backdrop of grief, William's final journey to his resting place was marked by whispers amongst the mourners who wondered as to whether there might have been something more sinister behind his untimely demise. In her typical fashion, Sarah's period of mourning was short as she swiftly embarked on a new relationship. She openly began seeing Mr. William Waldock and in February 1843, he proposed. It was rumoured that Sarah had demanded that he marry her, but the engagement was short-lived, as Mr. Waldock's friends intervened, expressing their concern over Sarah's past behaviour and the unexplained deaths of her two previous husbands and her son. Heeding their counsel, William made the wise decision to end the relationship and call off the engagement. He then very much distanced himself from Sarah, as he acknowledged the possible risks hidden within the depths of their courtship. As whispers of suspicion continued to swirl through the village, a decision was made to alert the Bedfordshire coroner, a gentleman named Mr Eagles. Responding to the mounting concerns, he ordered the exhumation of William's body and a post-mortem to be conducted, marking a pivotal moment in the unfolding saga. On Monday the 20th of March 1843, the Checkers Inn, a popular place in the village of Wrestlingworth played host to the resulting inquest. It was here that the grim truth emerged. Traces of arsenic were discovered in William's body. With the damning evidence in hand, an arrest warrant was issued against Sarah. However, it appeared that she had anticipated this turn of events, and by the time the authorities sought her out, she had already vanished from the village, her destination thought to be the sprawling city of London. The sudden disappearance of Sarah only deepened the mystery surrounding the tragic events, leaving the villagers with unanswered questions and the unsettling realisation that their quiet community harboured secrets darker than they could have imagined. In 1843, London was a bustling city. Locating an individual presented a formidable challenge amongst the labyrinth of streets and densely populated neighbourhoods. It required a combination of meticulous detective work and a reliance on traditional methods. Law enforcement officials scoured through the city's taverns, lodging houses and other similar haunts, relying on tips from informants or eyewitness accounts to narrow down their search. Additionally, notices could be posted in public places, offering rewards for information about someone's whereabouts. With the vastness of London and its diverse population, success often depended on the tenacity and resourcefulness of those conducting the search, as well as the cooperation of the community in providing vital clues. Sarah had secured lodging in Upper Wharf Street, a nondescript corner of the bustling city of London. Superintendent Blunden, with unwavering determination, embarked on an extensive search through the maze-like streets and alleys, tirelessly following every lead in his quest to locate her. After looking for some time and relying on the assistance of locals, his efforts paid off as he finally discovered the young woman he was looking for in a modest accommodation. Confronted by the superintendent, Sarah asserted her innocence, claiming ignorance of poisons or any involvement in obtaining them. Despite her protests, Superintendent Blunden took her into custody and arranged for her return journey to Bedford. The journey would take two days, so after the first day, the prisoner and her guards lodged at the Swan Inn in the town of Biggleswade. Sarah was made to share a room with three female staff members and found little solace in her surroundings. Restless and troubled, she sought to alleviate her unease by broaching morbid topics with the women. 
She inquired about capital trials and the gruesome process of execution by hanging. The peculiar nature of her inquiries did not escape the superintendent's notice when the female guards later reported it to him. Once Miss Sarah Daisley was safely in the Bedford jail, the investigation took another grim turn as the coroner ordered that the bodies of her first husband, Mr. Simeon Mead, and their son Jonah were to be exhumed. Following this, a post-mortem examination was conducted, which revealed that Jonah's body showed traces of arsenic, pointing to a potential cause for his untimely demise. However, in a frustrating twist, the body of Simeon was too decomposed to provide a definite answer of how he had ultimately died. This was a setback for investigators and left them wondering if he really had been poisoned, adding further complexity to the investigation. On the 24th of March 1843, Sarah found herself confined within the walls of Bedford Jail. With ample time on her hands, she dedicated herself to crafting a story against the grave charges laid upon her. In a desperate attempt to absolve herself of guilt, she made up a dubious tale, accusing William Daisley of poisoning both Simeon and Jonah. She suggested that his motive was rooted in jealousy, claiming that William sought to eliminate her former spouse, to claim her affections for himself. However, such outlandish claims failed to sway opinion and were promptly dismissed as ludicrous, particularly considering that Sarah herself stood accused of William's murder. Another dubious version emerged when she insinuated that William had inadvertently poisoned himself, a theory met with scepticism given the circumstances. At 9am on the 22nd of July 1843, Sarah Daisley faced trial for the murder of her second husband, Mr William Daisley, at the Bedfordshire Court. The case was presided over by Baron Alderson and Sarah pleaded not guilty. Notably absent from the proceedings was a charge regarding the death of her son Jonah. This remained on standby should the initial case against her falter. The courtroom buzzed with anticipation as witnesses took the stand, providing damning testimonies against the defendant. One witness was Mrs Elizabeth Daisley, the mother of Sarah's deceased husband. She recounted the harrowing ordeal of her son's illness, detailing the medical treatment he received from the doctor and the care provided by herself, Miss Anne Mead and Sarah Daisley. She tearfully told of despite their efforts, her son tragically died the following week. Anne Mead was next to testify. She informed the court how she had seen the defendant making some pills and how she had swallowed one herself in an attempt to persuade Mr Daisley to do the same. She said that she did so only to suffer severe illness shortly afterwards. Mrs Carver also recounted what she had witnessed, including Sarah's clandestine pill-making activities. Mr John Burnham, who is a chemist in Potham, also testified. He told how the defendant had purchased white arsenic from him and that he had written it in the poison register. In William Waldock's testimony, he introduced a new dimension to the case by recounting a conversation he had had with Sarah he recalled asking her how her marriage was, to which she chillingly replied, Very well, I have a very good husband, but I wish he was dead. He will soon be in the churchyard, and I will be happy to follow him. Mr Waldock further elaborated that Sarah, in the aftermath of allegations of abuse by her husband, expressed her determination to exact revenge on any man who dared to harm her. Continuing his testimony, Mr Waldock revealed that following the death of Mr Daisley, he started to court Sarah and after a few months proposed marriage to which she agreed. They then proceeded to have their intentions announced in the church. However, plagued by lingering rumours of Sarah's involvement in her husband's demise, he said that he ultimately decided to call off the marriage, unwilling to risk his own reputation in the face of public scrutiny. Dr George Dixon Headley, who had conducted the post-mortem examination, delivered compelling evidence that bolstered the case against the defendant. He testified that through the utilisation of the Marsh test, a meticulously sensitive method used for detecting arsenic, he unequivocally identified the presence of the poison in the deceased stomach and other organs. This revelation further implicated Sarah in the crime. The courtroom fell silent as the jury deliberated and they swiftly returned to deliver their verdict. Sarah Daisley was found guilty of her husband's murder. In a mere 30 minutes, 
Justice had been served, marking an end to a harrowing chapter in the town's history. Under the stern gaze of the judge, Sarah Daisley received the most severe of sentences, death by hanging. She was then escorted back to her cell. On the morning of Saturday the 5th of August 1843, the echoes of her fate reverberated within the confines of Bedford Prison. As the appointed hour approached, a solemn procession of onlookers gathered, drawn by morbid curiosity, to witness the spectacle that awaited. Sarah stood as a solitary figure, now a symbol of both infamy and tragedy. With the weight of her crimes heavily upon her, she climbed the stairs to the gallows, and it was noted that a chilling silence had descended upon the crowd. This was only broken by the sound of the church bells, marking the finality of her punishment. As the noose tightened, Sarah Daisley was hanged, and the day became a haunting reminder of the depths of human depravity. Her execution gained unprecedented attention, and it was estimated that thousands had witnessed the solemn events. In death, the name Sarah Daisley would now forever be etched in the annals of history as the only woman to be publicly hanged in Bedford Prison, her legacy now immortalised by the name the newspapers bestowed upon her, the Potten Poisoner. I would once again like to thank Mistplay for sponsoring today's video and to download the app for free. Please go to the link in the description. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.